Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. I'm letting everyone log in. My name is Julie Busby. I'm the founder of Busby Group, which is a residential real estate team in Chicago. We do all things real estate and we host webinars time to time for our clients with important, um, you know, uh, um, items that are many of us in Chicago are trying to figure out. Uh, and a lot of times we have had Grace here before, who's here with us tonight. And tonight we're excited to have Mary too. So an introduction for who we have tonight. We have Grace with Chicago Schools GPS. She's going to help us navigate high school admissions in Chicago, um, both public and private. Grace and I have known each other for many years through uh, Neighborhood Parent Network. She is an amazing resource. One of my favorite things in Chicago is our school system. Um, believe it or not, I think it's one of the best in the country. So I love that uh, we always have Grace to help us. And I'm super excited because I'm excited I have clients and, and friends that are already going through this. And I, maybe that's sad because I'm getting older, but we have... Um, uh, we have children who are about to go to college, and we have Mary O'Malley with us tonight, who's a partner and advisor, a college admissions advisor at uh, Union Hall. So Mary actually used to help with college admissions at Latin. So we're super excited to have her here. She's top notch and going to give us some amazing advice. So we're going to start with Grace, and then we'll lead into Mary. Um, and I'm just so excited that we have so many attendees here tonight. And at the very end, we'll do a Q and A. Um, so. Uh, if you two want to just say a, a quick hello, and then Grace, you can jump in. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start. I'm Grace Lee Sawin with Chicago School GPS. Um, we are a company that helps families find schools from preschool all the way through college, actually, as well. Um, but the bulk of it is, yes, we definitely encounter families who have little ones, um, in utero even, uh, all the way up. And as you journey through that uh, that at all the schools in Chicago. It is overwhelming, but as Julie said, they're wonderful schools, public and private. So we help families make sense of that. Wonderful. Hi, Julie, thank you. And Grace, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Mary O'Malley and I help people apply to college. Um, and you know, the process is certainly not what I went through in 1999. Um, and it's certainly changed even since COVID. So I'm excited to be uh, giving you guys some more information tonight. Amazing. Thank you, ladies. So happy to have a partnership with you both and be a resource for our clients. At the end, we will be sharing their information. And then again, we will do a Q&A as well. So uh, Grace, I'll let you steal the show. And um, I think Mary and I will get off camera so you can run with it. So thank awesome. you all. Thank, thank you, Busby Group, always. Um, it's such a pleasure to present to your families because, yes, they're, they're, it's a meaty topic. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera so you can see the slides. Um, but basically, what we're going to just talk about today, again, because we do uh, preschool all the way up through, through high school and beyond, um, it's just a lot for each section here. So we're just going to focus on high school tonight, and it's going to be a Fairly quick overview, um, about 45 minutes, but it is a time of, of this time right now. And oh, sorry, if you wanted to get our, our news, I know Julie's got some information, so don't worry if you, um, uh, you know, maybe we can get the <laughs> newsletter information later um, from Julie. Uh, but basically what I wanted to say is that Chicago right now, the timing is such that the CPS, Chicago Public School High Schools had recently, a week ago, almost, um, just released their, their notifications for this fall 2023 cycle. Um, so that's kind of timely for a lot of families. Maybe you're tuning in because you're in that process right now. But essentially what I want to say is that Chicago really is a, a, a city of choices, school choice, um, and being the third largest city, so, so many options. And if you guys, the parents here, we've got different age ranges, maybe you'll see a couple of siblings, um, all that, every child is different. So truly when we are reaching this high school age, um, they're, they're quite different than when you were finding a preschool or an elementary school. Your child was not as active in that selection process, but now they are with high school. So high school is definitely a time where there are so many different options for different types of learners. Um, 
Also, sometimes the thought is that your child is reduced to a number. And because of the CPS, Chicago Public School System, being that all the students um, are asked to you know, go into this process that has, for many of the schools, the ones that you hear about often called selective enrollment, um, a child is reduced to a 900 point score. And then um, there are some other ones that don't have that scoring system, but you know, just when you do hear about the process, that's the first thing that that tends to come to mind is that, wow, you know, it's not as holistic. But private school admissions are, are very, very holistic. Some of them may have testing, but the way that they utilize a test is not um, quite as, as straight, you know, just numbers. So we always tell families, um, high school, that selection of, you know, when your child has more of a say, do they want to be a big fish in a smaller pond or a smaller fish in a big pond? And this will dovetail to what Mary's going to talk about because really college admissions, um, wherever you are in high school, if your child can make, um, you know, make it, make a, a impression on that, that four years that they're in that high school, then that will really help you know, solidify and, and really position them for the college admission process. So that is the big, uh, you know, not just going to a name brand school or something like that, but really trying to find a place that your child can shine. So GPAs or grade point averages do start counting in ninth grade. So try and uh, find a fit that your child can do well right outside the, you know, right outside the gate. Um, and no school's perfect. As we know, we're probably, you know, been through the preschool selection and the elementary school selection. And you're, you know, there's no perfect school anywhere, but they're, you're trying to find um, a great fit with a lot of uh, myriad of factors. So for choosing a school, a high school, again, this is where your middle schooler is much more active than when you found the elementary school that they're in right now, um, because it does come down to maybe for the high school, that whole uh, feel that, that, oh, do they want the full high school experience or are they more focused on um, different, you know, smaller segments of that? Um, do, they, do they need the football team and the marching band um, or is it, you know, hey, this is the way that they teach their pedagogy is more in keeping with my child. Um, so, and the students are the ones, you know, making a lot of these, you know, what, saying their preference. Um, and then for what is entailed in the application process, and we'll go a little bit more um, into it in another slide, but essentially some of them do have some pre-eligibility requirements or, you know, for sure, we talked about testing, um, grade point averages, et cetera. So some, you know, when you're looking at a list for creating a high school, um, interest list, you really need to see where your child or your child needs to see where they fit in that. And then also travel time. So for um, those yellow school buses that you see around, those are all for elementary programs. For high school, the public schools, um, the students arrive through many means, but it's CTA or carpooling, um, you know, that sort of thing. It's not, you know, so transportation is a very big deal for high school and take that in consideration. Um, and then also just there's a lot of other factors and, and choices to get into why, you know, which, which schools are going to put on your list. So just know that it is four short years, but they're very impactful years. Um, and those, those considerations are definitely something to look at all the aspects too. In terms of when to start this process, um, I usually, when I have a longer presentation, I kind of ask in the chat, like, okay, what grade, you know, is your child? But for the most part, um, we say, you know, you can definitely start looking at schools in fifth and sixth grade. Um, for some schools, some private schools that go up to 12th grade, um, and maybe started in, in pre-K, they may actually increase their class sizes in the middle school years. And once you're in a school, you can stay at that school for the duration. So some families are maybe they've got, you know, slightly lower elementary children. They're looking at a private school that goes all the way up to 12th grade. And then they realize, oh, you know, Latin has extra uh, space and all their fourth graders can't fit into their fifth grade, um, you know, with their new, their, their middle school building. So there's some space or um, Parker at sixth grade. Um, so some of those time periods can be entry years. And then for 
Chicago public schools, there is something called the academic centers, which are accelerated um, middle school programs, essentially housed in a high school. And so a seventh grader is getting ninth grade curriculum um, in a high school and they can stay through the duration through 12th grade. Uh, essentially the academic centers, because they're starting high school at ninth grade um, or seventh grade with ninth grade curriculums, they can actually finish their whole required uh, coursework by the end of 10th grade. Um, but I do not recommend any child go to college <laughs> after finishing their, their high school you know, graduation requirements at the end of 10th grade. Um, so what happens for these students who go to academic centers, they at 11th and 12th grade, they're able to take a second science, another foreign language, um, you know, a, a science and um, you know, math, extra coursework, et cetera, um, singing, dancing, you know, all these extra years to get the most out of their high school curriculum. And then for the general pathway, definitely high school in Chicago is a ninth grade start. So ninth through 12th grade. Um, and then you apply typically one year ahead. So if you have, well, eighth grader right now, they're, they're finding out their public school options and they a month or two ago they found out their private school options and then there is something um, open to families if you're looking at 10th grade as a starting point so they'll be doing ninth grade somewhere but IMSA Illinois Math and Science Academy starts in 10th grade um, but there are some folks who apply as an eighth grader and essentially skip ninth grade to go into 10th grade so that's just you know something else to, to um, know as an option Otherwise, these programs, if you're looking at um, middle school into high school, there's oftentimes an entrance test or some kind of, you know, testing criteria. Uh, grades usually are looked at for both public and private. Um, seventh grade is the time period that you have finished, you know, a whole year's worth of, of curriculum. And so seventh grade grades are what uh, a lot of these programs look at. And then CPS tiers is a... Um, for selective enrollment high schools only, of which there's only 11, CPS tiers are um, a socioeconomic um, level, tiers one, two, three, and four are assigned based on where you live in the city of Chicago or outside actually, you can, they can even determine you know, what, what tier you'd be considered. And that is something that is a way to um, get about some level of uh, socioeconomic, you know, diversity, if you will, in some of these uh, select enrollment programs. So all that is just to say that in the entry year only, so typically for ninth grade is the time that CPS tiers or seventh grade academic centers are considered. Um, for how do you know, how does your middle schooler know what schools to target? Um, they really need to start visiting and taking a look at schools really in, you know, walking around, hearing from the departments. Um, a lot of private schools do have shadow days. So the shadow days typically for seventh grade spring, you hear a lot of parochial schools opening up their classrooms to have a student do a half day or a full day, um, shadowing literally, you know, following with a current student. Um, from you know, core classes to extracurriculars sometimes, you know, during if they're done during the day to lunch, um, things like that, being able to really get a day in the life feel. Um, a lot of the public schools don't necessarily have shadow days, but they do have these large open houses, which private schools do as well. But um, some of these Open houses are almost the only way to see some of these public programs. Um, but there are a few other ways to see what we usually say is if there is a sport that your child is interested in or maybe a fine art or, or you know, um, performing arts, then you can attend those uh, performances or those um, games and matches just to get a feel for the culture and climate. Absolutely, for these, you know, for these schools, that is another way that's not as um, sort of packaged, if you will, as an open house is sometimes feeling. But essentially, we try and tell families that usually um, there are quite a few high schools out there and they don't have a lot of, um, times where you can come in and, and take a look. Uh, a lot of these selective enrollment uh, CPS programs only have one open house per year in the fall uh, during the application cycle. 
and then that's really the the only way. So it, we try and tell families don't don't leave it all till eighth grade. Maybe take a look uh, starting sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. So spread that out, and also those shadow days um, for sure. Try and spread those out a little bit as well. But all of this is really to inform your student. Hey, can they um, you know get that culture and climate, that feel for each school from some of these. Um, from some of these opportunities. So um, just know that that the private schools are more open to shadowing than the public schools and um, seventh grade spring or eighth grade fall is the time to do that. Um, so we're gonna kind of divide a little bit between public um, and the private process. Uh, the public schools right now, the CPS just did a big revamp last year uh, and this cycle right now that, there were in, that we're in. Um, they have something called the priority or round one application. That's the main process that does start every fall. Uh, this year it went from, I believe it was September 21st to December 8th. Um, just a big window, a big window of time. You don't have to be the first child to apply and when it opens up, but certainly don't miss that deadline um, when it closes, the portal closes. So this is round one or priority, however they call it. Essentially, it is when most of the you know Chicago area families are applying. It's really that priority window to do the testing if you need that, to take a look at schools and, and do the application. Um, what is involved in the application for CPS are, as I said, a lot of schools do look at the final grades for seventh grade, but only in four subject areas. So whether or not you tell your student this is up to you, but reading, math, science, and social studies are the only final grades that CPS is taking into consideration for the high school application. And then there is this um, high school admissions test that this year um, CPS uh, did give to all of their eighth graders in October, I want to say, and then to non-CPS students in a couple of weekends in, in November. Um, and that was just to get some level of a standardized um, test score because there was no more. They used to, CPS used to do NWEA, NWEA MAP testing. They no longer do that. Um, some families ask, is attendance considered in this, um, you know, the, the rubric? No. Um, info sessions, there used to be IB stands for International Baccalaureate. There used to be info sessions that were considered for um, some of these programs so that you could learn about that and be a little bit more informed. That through COVID was no longer required and it has not come on board. Um, this fall, I'm not quite sure what they're going to add on, um, but I, I don't, I don't think attendance will come back. Whether or not info sessions will, will remain to be seen. And then if there is a performing arts program or visual arts um, auditions or portfolios may be required. And this year they did a lot of that in person again. There are also what's called service leadership academies. Um, they used to have an info session and this year they did not. So some of these things that I'm telling you are, are this from this cycle, but CPS uh, does, has reserves the right to change their process, and they have um, from year to year. So this is just what recently happened. But we want to emphasize that there really are a breadth of high schools in Chicago public schools. Um, you do have one guaranteed non-application based high school, and that is your neighborhood assigned school based on where your address is. So every Every student, every every you know residence in Chicago has an assigned neighborhood elementary and assigned neighborhood high school that doesn't require um, any kind of minimum or testing or anything like that. So everybody can automatically come in. Uh, however, you can absolutely apply for any other um, high school with multiple programs. Each high school can house multiple programs. So some of them have academic requirements, some of them don't. Um, but basically, you know, essentially what's happening is that, you know, every high school, like for instance, Lincoln Park High School, I think we have a slide talking about that, will have um, different programs within it. And you can come in not as a neighborhood student by applying to those. So this is just to summarize because, you know, I don't want to belabor too much. Um, but for the most part, for the select enrollment high schools of which there are 11, um, that's it in the whole entire city. Um, there are two parts currently this, this cycle this, that just concluded that consist of grades and the um, 
high school admissions test. So those two parts give um, each component 450 points, adds up to 900 points, and that's really how um, seats are awarded based on scores, high scores on down. Um, these select enrollment high schools, they're varying in size. Um, some have less than 300 freshmen uh, coming in and others like Lane Tech have over a thousand freshmen coming in. So that can impact a lot of families think that these are the only high schools out there. They're not. But I do want to say that, you know, a larger high school has clearly more room um, for, you know, a wider, wider range of students. Otherwise, within CPS, not only is there selective enrollment high schools, but there are what's um, considered this application called choice application. And that has up to 20 programs that can be put onto this choice application where one school can have multiple programs in it. So, um, you know, international baccalaureate is something that um, uh, 22 high schools in the city of Chicago neighborhood high schools have the small cohort within the neighborhood high school that can apply from outside the neighborhood boundaries. Um, Lincoln Park, Taft, Ogden, these all have international baccalaureate programs. And that is certainly, the, those are schools that have their boundaries. But outside of that, if someone is interested in getting to that school, commuting to that school, um, they can do so by targeting the international baccalaureate program and um, be able to, it's again, screened by a point system with grades and um, high school you know, uh, test. But that is another way to get into a school. So really, while one has an assigned neighborhood school, actually many students don't necessarily go to their assigned neighborhood school because they can look at other programs and apply into them. Um, there are magnet programs like Von Steuben and Disney II, and those actually may just be lottery. There's no point rubric at all. Um, or within Von Steuben, there's another program called the Scholars Program, and that will have a um, separate you know, rubric with an essay and a recommendation, but it's a small uh, program within a larger you know, high school. So there are just, this is, you know, just trying to emphasize that there are other um, little subsets of programs within a high school's wall. Jones College Prep, a lot of people know that as a selective enrollment high school, meaning that that first bucket of um, test grades, uh, grades and sorry, the test. And then there's also still considering grades and tests, but Jones has a CTE career to education, which seems flipped to me, but anyway, so uh, CTE program, which is a specialty program that Jones houses two streams, pre-law and pre-engineering, and they're very small cohort that comes in this way, but it's not through the selective enrollment process, it's through this bucket for um, students who are interested in pre-law or pre-engineering. Jones's program and Hancock as well, they both, the programs were both conceived to really give a, a option for families who live close to the school. So there is an, what's called an overlay boundary. Um, and that one is just, you know, if you live within a certain range or street um, boundaries, then you can be considered for the smaller cohort of pre-law, pre-engineering in those schools. Um, and they, but they still look at grades and they still look at, um, the test, it's just a slightly different pool and it's also a different emphasis with those um, pre, you know, um, professional uh, types of programs. And then, so this is emphasizing, so among choice, so as I was kind of explaining, one high school can have multiple streams or multiple um, application, you know, categories to apply. So Lincoln Park High School, is a neighborhood high school that's not even on one of these uh, six that I've listed here, but it's a neighborhood high school that you don't even have to apply. If you are in that neighborhood boundary, you're automatically in. However, if you're not in the neighborhood boundary, there is a way to get into Lincoln Park High School based on there's up to six. You can do multiple. You can certainly um, apply to maybe you've got um, a student who really likes the IB program um, and is shooting for the IB diploma, but also is interested in double honors program. 
is an actor who loves to draw and plays an instrument and also sings. So potentially a student, if they can apply up to 20 programs on this choice application, then they may put, and they really want Lincoln Park High School, they may put six if they have the criteria, meaning drama, I think is an audition, visual arts is a portfolio, and music the, for the band or the orchestra, you have to uh, audition, and then uh, vocal as well. You know, if your child can is okay with scheduling all of those, then that could be um, trying to get into the same high school through different means. This is all you are going to have to rank. Your child's going to have to rank what is their first choice for this high school or for their school selections, basically of these 20 programs, maybe, you know, they want to do all six, but um, which one is their first choice, which one's their second choice, et cetera. So you are ranking all these um, because you're only accepted into, you're only given a single offer. You're only accepted into one of those programs, but truly once you're in a high school, you absolutely can um, maybe, you know, take advantage of, let's say you're not um, an actor per se, but you really are interested in it. Um, maybe you came in through the IB diploma program. You could certainly, you know, be part of the plays, um, but it's just the student who came in through the drama um, bucket is one who's, you know, the first choice for the drama program is given to those students. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, conversely, so for Shy Arts, Chicago High School for the Arts is a CPS program that they do have even more um, streams of, of ways to get in. But in the past, they've said you can apply only up to two programs. Um, so if you are a triple, quadruple, quintuple threat and you have all these um, talents, you may have to prioritize in which of the top two are is, is what you're um, coming in under. So some of these, you know, do have more um, um, rubrics or points based. Others are maybe somewhat lottery based, etc. So it just depends. Just know that up to 20 programs does not mean 20 different high schools. Uh, and certainly, if you are targeting a particular high school, see which different streams you can. You know, your child has um, the the talent or, or desire to apply for. Um, for Selective Enrollment High School, as we said, there's only 11 in the city. You can only apply up to six. Um, this is a parallel application. So that choice application I talked about has those 20. You get a single offer at the end, you're ranking all 20. This is parallel to that is the Selective Enrollment application. You can apply up to six, still single offer as well. Two parts of the application, as I said, only four subject areas, the seventh grade final grades, and then also that testing um, is, is part of it. Um, and then the 900 is a maximum point total. Um, and after the notifications, which this year came out at the end of, well, we're at the last end of March now, but um, last a week ago, they do release a cut score for a lot of these programs. So you can kind of see to gauge um, the competitiveness, if you will, um, at the end, you know, um, when they release the notifications. Uh, but it does change year to year. So these cut scores are not, um, you know, they're totally determined by every, you know, cohort that, that tests every year. So what we do say about selective enrollment programs is please know that these programs are academically advanced. Selective enrollment, um, really a lot of them do honors and AP level, you know, college um, prep level, and they are not necessarily um, a good fit for every student. So that is absolutely something that Right now, I see this, um, you know, happening where families have strived for, let's say, only uh, selective enrollment, but their child, um, you know, has has certainly um, maybe some struggles in some subject areas, um, certainly doing well in others. But, you know, this whole school, the whole curriculum is accelerated in these selective enrollment programs. And they're all slightly different. So each selective Roman high school, there's 11. Um, each one of those 11, first off, they're in different parts of the city. Um, and then they also have, you know, as we said earlier, different sizes. Some are smaller, some are larger. 
any larger school will certainly have much more to choose from in terms of a full um, offering for sports, for extracurriculars and clubs. Um, you know, a larger high school like Lane Tech has, I think, every AP advanced placement um, course that is offered. They do have enough students to make sure that, you know, they're, they are able to, um, to have all those offerings versus a smaller select enrollment high school. You know, you may have heard of, well, let's say um, Northside and Peyton are one of the smaller ones, but they don't necessarily have every AP course or, you know, they, that you may have to um, make some sacrifices there. Um, another thing with, you know, when Peyton's talked about a lot, people say, oh yes, you know, I heard it's a really good school. It's centrally located. That's great. You know, I've got a child who really likes to swim. Um, well, Peyton actually doesn't have a pool. They co-op with Jones College Prep for swimming. So if you have a child who definitely wants to swim, maybe they're really very involved and they want to continue that through high school and be a part of um, swim team, well, if they go to Peyton, they are going to have to, um, you know, maybe there's a morning practice and an afternoon practice, morning practice before 8 o'clock uh, when school starts. So they may have to go, because um, Peyton doesn't have a pool, but Jones does, they may have to go first show up and do the swim practice in the morning at Jones, go to school at Peyton, and then go back to Jones in the afternoon to do the afternoon swim practices. So that is something that you know families have to understand. A student who's choosing that but wants to participate in certain extracurriculars um, has to navigate that. So a lot of these factors, A, may not be a great fit for many reasons, um, but also just extracurricular and whatnot. So we try and have families understand, you know, really that's why the tour is important um, and being able to, you know, see the whole picture of what those four years are going to be like. And also transportation, right? If you have younger students um, still in elementary and, and you're trying to do this drop off and trying to do the morning and they're not driving and you don't necessarily want them to drive um, right away in the city, you know, all that, how are you going to logistically um, make that work? So that's just something that every family should and every student should think about. Um, I touched on this a little bit, but the tier system is really only applicable for the entry year of a program um, and only applicable really for the selective enrollment high schools in the high school realm. Um, if you have an elementary school student, it does also apply to magnet schools um, for the entry year but and their selective enrollments. But the tier system, again, you hear about a lot of it on the playgrounds and, and you know, um, that sort of thing. But essentially what it is, is it's only applicable for that specialty program, the select enrollment in the entry year. And it's a way to get a level of diversity in these programs that are considered citywide. Citywide meaning that they are open and trying to draw um, from all over the city. And so when they are seating their um, entering class, there should be a, a consideration for the socioeconomics of where these students are coming from. Um, there are four socioeconomic tiers in the city of Chicago and the basic, you know, they're never asking a family their personal information, but they are taking data because we all know data is out there on everything and everyone, but um, a census tract is bigger than a block, smaller than a zip code. And this area, the census tract, there is data for what the median family income is for that census tract, what the educational attainment of the parents are, um, what whether it's more home owners versus renters, um, if English is a first language predominantly at home, um, if it's single versus dual parent households, and the performance of the local area school. All of this tends to, you know, when you have um, high income and, and high performing local schools and more homeowners, et cetera, you tend to be what's called tier four is a high socioeconomic tier. And then certainly for the, um, the other, you know, it goes down to tier one as a lower tier. But essentially what we're saying is that when you're applying, these, this tier system will apply for the select enrollment high schools only where 30% of the incoming freshman class is given over to 
doesn't matter what tier these students live in. They're, it's just irrespective. They could all be tier four, which is that highest is going to tier, right? But 17.5% of the incoming freshman class does have to come from the top scores from each of the four tiers. So 30%, um, let's say to Whitney Young, could be from tier four, and 17.5% have to be from tier four. So maybe 47.5% of Whitney Young's um, freshman class could all be tier four. Um, so there is this big bucket here. Now, as I say this, last year CPS was debating on changing this, um, the, the percentages. They did not. Uh, so why, we don't know next year what's going to happen. So I'm just putting it out there. This is, please don't think that this is necessarily written in stone. Um, anyway, so these are the only for those selective enrollment ones like academic centers and selective enrollment high schools. Um, just in summary for the application process, it is something that there is a portal. It's all online. Create an application. If you're a CPS student, it all goes from your ID. Um, if you have a non-CPS student, then they are going to create one uh, CPS ID for that fam for that student. And then you're just going to look, you know, put down programs. You're going to have to rank them. But also if you need additional screenings, um, auditions, et cetera, that's going to be scheduled all through that portal. Um, so definitely, you know, be sure not to miss any deadlines. Be sure to schedule everything. Um, all CPS students are given the high school admissions test in October. At least they did this. They haven't announced this coming um, fall cycle what date, but they did this past year. They did all the CPS students took the high school admissions test in their in their CPS school, and non-CPS students had to take it on the weekends. And then last year, the application opened in September, closed a sec, you know that December eighth. And then you do have to rank up to twenty for that one choice uh, application, and up to six for selective. And then this past year, um, just last week, they did notify. Uh, so there's a long process um, between December to March. In the meantime. You know, there is, um, just know that your neighborhood school is guaranteed and this Go CPS application process will allow for two other school offers. Um, one for select enrollment, one for choice, but you can't send your child to multiple schools simultaneously. So you're going, he or she is going to have to pick one. Um, and then if a student declines offers, there's a rolling wait list. This is new this year. They kind of did a little bit last year, but basically this year, that uh, waitlist will roll. Um, this is the first year they published waitlist numbers for select enrollment high schools. And I will say that um, it's very deceptive because schools like Peyton, Jones, Northside Lane, they do not move as a waitlist. Um, they over offer spots the way colleges do sometimes. They over offer spots um, knowing that typically maybe, I don't know, 10% of the students don't accept. So they over offer 10 by 10% or whatnot. There is a process, a holistic process called principal's discretion, which is a way to um, make a case beyond points, uh, make a more holistic case for only selective enrollment. That's the process is only available for that. But that is something that um, families can take part in or students can take part in if they did not get an initial selective enrollment um, offer. And then there is a spring uh, testing period, which is a little deceptive. Some families are like, what? You know, are they setting aside some kids for late in the process? No. The spring testing, if you hear any buzz and rumors about that, is really for people who miss the entire fall application cycle and want to have a point rubric score to um, give them, you know, uh, something to look at all the leftover remaining not filled programs. Okay. Um, all right. So just in our, my few minutes left, let me go. It's a little bit more um, straightforward for independent parochial high schools in the sense that um, they're, you know, each high school has their own requirements and their own deadlines. Um, so, so really you have to start looking and seeing what each high school requires for a private high school. They do have shadow days. Definitely try and take advantage of that. Independent schools may require an ISE, independent school at entrance exam or SSAT for some of the boarding schools. Um, but testing, 
you know, may or may not be required and, and is just one factor. It's not as much um, the way the CPS looks at it. Test scores can be due after the application itself. You may have a window of time where a school will say, okay, can you get us your ISEE score by this date, which could be after the application is due. Parochial schools have um, um, basically one day that they test everybody. HSPT is their test, and that's usually the first Saturday in December. Um, if there's a top choice school, parochial school, they try not to have schools poach <laughs> from one another, meaning that if your child's looking at DePaul College Prep and Ignatius, they cannot physically sit for that exam in both places at one time. So um, they have to almost, you know, pre-select which, which school they're going to sit for the exam for, because really there's so many applicants for each of the, all these schools and Royal Academy is another one and Fenwick is another one where if you don't sit for the exam at that school, they will not consider you. Um, otherwise, the applications are much more holistic. They will require essays or sometimes an interview, recommendations, et cetera. Um, but the timing for those could be, you know, a little bit different than the application due date. So just know that. And then some may have a parent interview as well. So, so really it all depends, but, and all the deadlines are different, but typically all the deadlines are before CPS, um, in terms of when they're going to notify you. So, um, and when you need to sign your contract, um, there's quite a few private school options out there. As I said, you know, everyone, a private school is private for a reason. There is a pedagogy, there is a, you know, a philosophy, et cetera. So they're all over. Um, but just the way that CPS has international baccalaureates, certainly that was kind of more um, originally founded for private schools that have an international um, focus. So we have quite a few in the Chicago land area, um, and then certainly religious schools and independent schools of different types for the arts, uh, Montessori as well, progressive, et cetera, Waldorf style. So lots of different options. Um, yeah, so what we wanted to say is if you've got a sixth grader out there, you know, start to look and see towards some schools, seventh grade, those grades count, um, maybe recommendations, think of who you're going to ask and shadow eighth grade for sure, uh, fill out those applications and do any testing that's required. And then certainly throughout sixth, seventh and eighth grade, you can start to look at, um, absolutely open houses and school fairs, um, et cetera. So we definitely want to just tell parents, keep an open mind. Students, keep an open mind because the school that you hope your child would attend may not have been the best fit school for him or her. So definitely look at schools without preconceptions. The school is not what makes your child, not the name of the school. It's what your child does at that school that is most important. So they can go to a name brand school, but if they're not taking advantage of all the things that it has to offer, they're not going to stand out for college. Um, 10th grade transfers are possible. So this whole process is very fraught. We understand. But if they don't get into their, their choice, you know, the, what they want for ninth grade, um, a lot of these schools, including selective enrollment schools, do have transfers. And it's just a totally different, more holistic process. And no school is perfect, as you know. Um, so, so just keep an open mind. Um, we are, again, Chicago School GPS. We, we kind of are tutoring for parents, um, but we absolutely can help sort of spearhead and, and help you focus, uh, help your middle schooler focus their, their search. Um, we also, just so you know, have an annual Hidden Gems High School Fair. It's always, you know, the end of September, beginning of October. So this year it's October 1st, where we bring together public and private high schools that are hidden gems. <laughs> so not, not these impossible to get into ones. Um, so this year it's going to be a World Cup College Prep. And yes, so that is, that is us, um, Chicago School GPS. So I will turn it over to Mary, who will give you that second piece. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. That is awesome. Every time I learn something new from you, and we have focused so many times on elementary, so it's so good to have all the feedback on high school. So anyways, Mary, uh, on to you. We're excited to hear more about college. So thank you. I'll, uh, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Grace. Um, I am going to share my screen and kind of dive into some higher level thoughts um, about the college admission process. So again, my name is Mary O'Malley. I've been doing 
involved in higher ed in some capacity for about 15 years, whether it's uh, working colleges or working with high school students. Um, and I've been with Union Hall for about the last two years. Um, it's when I mention the work I do kind of at dinner parties or even just in casual conversation, I am suddenly incredibly popular. Um, everyone has a story to tell about their own college process, whether it was two years ago or 20. Um, a thought to offer or really just wants to tell me how to do my job. Um, and I think that it's it's interesting to me because this press this process is is covered in so much mystery. Um, and I feel like parents parents think it is a mystery. They believe it. Um, and I'm here to kind of spread show some light um, on on how it actually works. It's interesting um, that we're we're doing this tonight um, as Ivy League. Uh, oops, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, as Ivy League decisions are dropping, literally kind of as we speak. So Harvard um, released their numbers, and they went up actually in their admit rate from a 3.19 to a 3.41. So that's interesting. Um, but in the, the next couple of days and the weeks, you'll see a lot of articles um, like this. To get into the Ivy League, extraordinary isn't always enough. Um, you'll also see a lot of stories about, um, you know, some student who was admitted to 70 plus schools and got multi millions of dollars in financial aid and scholarships. Both are extreme. You can only end up going to one school. When the world shut down um, March 2020, the college decisions were literally just dropping. Um, traditionally, that's when schools roll out the red carpet for their applicants. Um, with all of us in quarantine, they couldn't do that. Parents, families couldn't go revisit. Um, admissions officers could not host receptions at the Maggiano's in Oak Brook, where they all are. Um, higher ed, especially admissions, is a very, very slow moving boat. So much like the Titanic, they don't pivot well. When COVID happened, they had to pivot very, very quickly and some major changes happened. Um, the recruitment went online for the classes of uh, really for high school 2021 is when it started. Um, and colleges learned that you could track your behaviors um, online. So when they send an email, they can check and see who opened it. They can, you know, look at click rates and they do. Um, and this will come into play a little bit longer, but the major changes were that demonstrated interest became a huge part of the process. Standardized testing became optional um, at really everywhere um, because you couldn't get as many, you couldn't sit 20 kids in a room together to take the test. Because standardized testing was optional, application numbers skyrocketed. Um, without the kind of the barrier of the testing, kids just thought they could apply anywhere. And they could. Um, and because of all those high numbers, the admit rates tanked. Um, much like Harvard's 3.41%, um, you know, kind of the top schools are all very similar to that. Um, did colleges love this? 100% absolutely. It made them look better in terms of U.S. News and World Report rankings, which is kind of, you know, the holy grail of admissions. When the media reports kind of the difficulty of gaining acceptance, they're doing you a huge disservice. They are ultimately reinforcing the narrative that everyone should want to attend only a handful of schools. And that is simply not true. There are 4,500 colleges in this country, and 75% of those 4,500 accept 75% of their applicants. There is a school for everyone. Um, the question to me becomes, if this is the world we live in, how, how do you do this? How do you navigate the application process? And I want to kind of challenge you a little bit to think of, challenge your mindset. Think about this in a different way. Um, Dr. Richard Whiteside, who was the former dean of admission at Tulane for a long, long time, um, said this, colleges are a business and the office of admission is a chief revenue officer. I'm just gonna let that, that sit for a second. Colleges are businesses. They educate you after you pay your tuition. But as any business does, they act in their own best interest. So their goal is not always to take you know, the top 10 kids in any given class. They are looking to fill um, what are called institutional priorities. 
and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I live in Chicago, and Chicago love the University of Notre Dame. So this is a, a snapshot, if you will, of 10 years from 2012 to 2021, um, looking at their number of applications and the increase. Uh, and if you look at the bottom, the green line indicates how the number of students they admitted each year. So where you can see the application numbers steadily growing and um, for 2021, 2022, they actually increased uh, 25% in the early admission round. They're not admitting any other any more students. So it's not like they admitted 25% more kids. They didn't, It's that's pretty static. Um, and I think that's something parents don't always think about is, you know, if 75 kids from St. Ignatius College Prep apply to Notre Dame, you know, the numbers aren't always going to be in your favor because they're not taking simply the best students. Um, there's an old story kind of in admissions world that um, Duke, VP of admissions, Christoph, I always forget his last name, Christoph, um, likes to talk about in admissions committees that he wants to know how you're going to add to the academic community, how you're going to add to the campus community, and then are you nuts? So when I work with families and students, I try and frame the application in those three, um, those three pillars, those three buckets. Um, and while you don't know what the institutional priorities are, if you can answer those three questions, you're generally going to be looking, um, you're going to be doing pretty good. So there are three main components to the admissions process. The most important of which are these institutional priorities, these institutional um, agendas, which are dictated kind of by a couple of skip levels above the admission office. Um, the admission office is tasked with recruiting whatever kids they have deemed that they want. So if uh, Ohio State has said that they really need some redheaded tuba players from Ohio, if you are a brownheaded uh, clarinet player from Wisconsin, you know, it's going to be a little bit harder to get into Ohio State. Um, what the student can control is personal narrative. Um, the rigor of their transcript, uh, the rigor of their classes, their transcript, their extracurriculars, and to some level, the letters of recommendation. Um, their testing, should they choose to submit it, uh, is a little bit, um, you know, it's also in their control. So the ACT, SAT, and AP exams. I want to make a note about rigor because one of the questions I always get asked is, um, you know, is it better to get an A in a regular level college prep class or a B in an AP class? And the answer is always the B in the AP class. Um, because colleges, when they're evaluating your transcript, they're evaluating you where you began and where you were able to get to. So easy way to think about that is, are you, um, if you entered in pre-algebra, you can't grow to calculus in four years. It's just not possible. There isn't enough time. But if you go from pre-algebra to algebra one, and then maybe honors geometry, and you can do honors algebra two, that's increasing your rigor. So it's, again, a little bit different way to think about things. Um, smart applicants focus on controlling what they can control. You can't become a redheaded tuba player from Ohio if you live in Wisconsin. Um, so I encourage students to really develop a strong personal narrative um, that indicates to a college you, you know who you are, you know what you want, and you can tell your own story. The demonstrated interest piece is what truly terrifies me about this process um, because, again, the, it seems like colleges believe that uh, the yield, so how many admitted students enroll is, is the, golden, the golden number. Um, and it indicates if a college is healthy, if a college wants, you know, if students are really, really wanting to go to a college. I would guess, um, and I haven't seen this number, but Harvard probably will admit or will yield about 90% um, of their admitted students. And then finally, uh, what I really work with families on is applying kind of smartly and very broad. So again, if you're wanting to go to Notre Dame from St. Ignatius um, and there are 75 other kids in the applicant pool, you're, you know, at some level, at some point, one Ignatius kid is going to look exactly like the others. It is incredibly hard to stand out. So I spend a lot of time with families thinking about kind of like Grace does, um, 
you know, what do you want to do when you get there? What's important for you to have? Who do you want to be surrounded by? How do you learn? What type of classes do you want? Um, and building a list based on that, as opposed to just focusing on kind of the, the top, uh, you know, 25 schools. Kind of in conclusion, I guess, because um, I know I'm running out of time, a strong narrative is honestly the best way to gain admission. So if you're able to kind of do the Duke example, explain why, um, how you will add to the academic community, explain how you'll add to the campus community and kind of demonstrate that you're a nice kid, it really does go far. Um, I challenge families to think about this as you are handing a map um, with your application over to to the admission office and you're, you have the ability to highlight what you feel is important and where you want them to, to dig into. And it, this is not a one size fits all process. So there's lots of different ways to go about it. Um, and again, the demonstrating the, how you're going to contribute rather than what you have done, what you have done in high school is important, but you have to kind of turn around and look forward as well. And again, I, my, my students always make fun of me to some extent, because one of the first things I always say to them is, are you on the mailing list? And are you, um, are you opening the emails? Again, yield is defined as the number of students who enroll in a college after admitted. And higher yield means more revenue for the college, which is why, you know, I could do a whole other presentation on the benefits of early action and early decision. Um, but Northwestern University said that they admitted over 50% of their applicants this year in the early decision binding round. So by December 31st, they had 50% of their class enrolled um, and they knew what the tuition revenue was going to be for the following year. So it's just, it's different ways to think about this. Does this process have to be, you know, you living in an, the heart attack range on an EKG for the next four or five or 18 years? No. But it does merit um, kind of some reflection for, from your student and from your family about what you want. And for high school kids, that can be challenging. That can, you know, not feel so good. So um, what I really aim to do is, is do just that. Help parents guide them through the process and make sure that children are, or students are applying to places where they'll be successful on day one, rather than places that get 75% of the, you know, 75 uh, students applying from one single class. And then I, apparently I stopped, I was talking and didn't share things. So um, apply broadly, but that doesn't mean stupidly. So again, creating a list that has some safeties, some targets, some reaches, um, and you'll have, you'll have success. Hi. Thank you, Mary. I personally found that really informative because I mean, I'm, I'm super early stages. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, <laughs> but goodness, I loved the, the idea of like uh, uh, early action and early results or whatever that was, that would be really interesting down the road. So um, thank you both. I always learn something new from you, from you both. And I'm so excited to have Mary here for our first time too. So um I'm going to open this up and see if anyone out there has any questions about the high school admissions process in Chicago and or college admissions. So if anybody has any questions, let us know and we will be happy to answer them. Oh, I just, we Lauren, just got them. Yeah. yeah. Lauren has two questions. Does it matter? Do you see it matter if kids don't live close to their school or friends? Is Lauren, is this for the high school process? Um, I could answer, I could answer that. Yes. Um, yes. yes. So the high school process, it is something that a lot of, we always say, again, they are 14 when they're figuring this out. They're like, oh, I don't want to go to, you know, without my friends. But it turns out, like, honestly, they, they, it's a whole new world, high school, right? You find your people. I always, you know, definitely there's this whole fear of lane tech. It's so big. Well, it's so big, but it also has so many different smaller communities, right? And so you start to really realize like, oh yes, you're growing as a person, your interests are changing and that's okay. So 
really the friends you had in middle school, you're going to get a whole new set of experiences and friends and encounters and everything like that. So it doesn't matter <laughs> um, in terms of living close to the, you know, a lot of them hang out at school. So um, wherever they live is not necessarily as relevant because they do have a lot of that school interaction or teams or extracurriculars, sports, et cetera. Um, what, are, oh, what are good ways, I guess maybe this is both for Mary and me, figuring out whether a high school has quality college counselors. I will say that um, certainly the smaller class size and um, counselor to student ratio will typically yield um, more, more personalized service. Sometimes, you know, really depends obviously on the quality of the college um, counselors, but some of them for CPS, a, there usually is um, more students per counselor. And those counselors are not just college counselors. They are literally guidance counselors, right? So they have social emotional needs and, you know, just beyond and, and even the scheduling, um, the, you know, day-to-day -day and transcripts and all that stuff. So um, public and private, we do find that families, if they do want a lot of that handholding, um, that they do private counselors like Mary, you know, so they actually do go beyond their, their school. Um, and so it's not as much of a factor, I say, I guess, in picking, because even those private schools with really small or specialty college counselors as part of the high school, um, families are still going to private counselors. So, you know, it's not necessarily a factor, I guess. Mary, do you want to add anything on that? I think it's a great question. I think it's hard to answer. Um, you know, when I worked at Latin, I had 38 students in my in each my senior and junior class. Um, and that was what I was responsible for. I work with students from Whitney Young and, um, you know, some of the highly selectives and their counselors are doing exactly what Grace said. It's a lot of the, the other work. Um, and they have caseloads of 400 to one. Um, so I think it's, you know, Figuring out the high school to me would be, and how your students can be successful there, really, you know, kind of honing in on their own interests and making sure it's a place that they will be academically challenged. They will have the extracurriculars that they want. Um, they'll kind of find their people in some context. Uh, if, you're, if you can do that, you're, you're going to have success in the college process because you're, um, you know, your, your kids are going to be authentic. And so, you know, probably a better business answer for me is that, um, you know, look at where, uh, and most places will say, you know, this is the bio of the college counselor. You want to make sure that they've worked in colleges and, you know, selective college admissions offices. Um, and because they, they have then seen the process and they've, you know, read the applications and recruited the students, but that's not, it, it's, Messy. It's a messy, messy question. <laughs> Mary, I have a question because um, this is all new to me. I mean, the fact that they got rid of state, well, there wasn't a required standardized test. Uh, where do you think the future is for standardized tests for, for college applications? That might be a loaded um, question. <laughs> you know, I can give you my cynical answer um, and I can probably <laughs> give a better one. I, I, I think they're staying optional. I think the colleges were... Um, a little bit surprised at the increase in the application numbers. Mm. And that's, you know, again, that's a benchmark for them. They want to, every year you want record um, admission applica applicants and you want low admit rates and removing standardized testing ah. did that. Um, I, so again, their businesses yeah. looking at this through the lens of what makes us look better, what makes us look better to U.S. News and World Reports. Um, so that's the cynical answer. The more professional answer, I think, is that standardized testing actually, it's not when an admission officer is reading your application and you don't submit an, a, a score that they're like, oh, God, they tanked it. Some kids are just not good testers. Um, and so I feel like, you know, there are always kids that, you know, an admission officer falls in love with on the page and they know that they can do the work at Northwestern or U Chicago, but that test is just isn't there. Um, I think it gives up kids more opportunities. But again, that's, you know, it's a great question. It's messy, as is most of this process. I feel like the thing I say the most is it depends. Um, but, you know, some kids aren't good testers. I'm thrilled that they don't have to submit. I find all that too. Is there, are, are they going to share data or is there data out there of 
the ones who actually uh, are admitted who took the tests or, you know, submitted the test and who didn't? Um, some, sure. Uh, yeah. Some don't. One of the best things I could ever tell someone is there's this common data set that all colleges who receive federal funding have to submit. And so I Google it, University of Michigan common data set, and it pulls up this real rough looking document. It's, it's not pretty, um, but it contains like the keys to the car. And um, I would imagine the next couple of years, that's going to be one of the things in section C, which is the admission section um, that, you know, they're going to have to start reporting, but most, most places have not. Okay. Great. Wish there would. I know. I know. Well, I, I feel like in the coming years, they will, if it remains optional. Yeah. So. The big kicker um, for whether or not I think colleges will go test optional, um, you know, in the Midwest, Purdue went back to mm. requiring testing for next year. And I thought that might have been a domino effect, but it hasn't been. So I think we're we're going to remain in this test optional landscape for a while. Interesting. Well, we are just running slightly over. Any remaining thoughts? Any remaining questions? I'll, I'll open up for remaining questions. It doesn't look like we have any more. Uh, any remaining uh, closure statements, uh, Grace and Mary? I would, I, I would just like to say your your kids will will be fine. <laughs> they will be fine. <laughs> not one school creates their happiness. Um, whether it's you know high school or college, they really have to be open to um, just wherever they are taking advantage of that experience and really, you know, putting themselves fully into it um, because it's not the name of the school that they go to. It's really what they do at the school. It's going to make that difference. Love that. Yeah. And I, I would absolutely second that. Um, I would also say it's probably a good idea to turn off the news um, as it relates to college admissions in the yeah. next couple of days because I don't think it's going to be great. Um, but oh, again, man. The news stories are out of context. This is a very, this process is very individual to families and students and different high schools. So um, there's always more to the story. Thank you all. I, we are going to share their information um, to all of the uh, attendees as well as anyone else out there. We'll, we'll save this recording because I think this is really useful information and I'm so thankful to you both. So thank you all who attended. Everyone have a wonderful night and um, sending all the best to your children out there as well. So thank you both. Thank I appreciate you, it. Thank you, Cosby Group. Thank Always you. Love Talk soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>